Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another captivating episode of Timeless Talks. Who is his Siri? I'm your host David Lee, the moderator who loves to delve into the minds of the greatest thinkers in history. Today, we have a truly remarkable guest, Napoleon Bonaparte. Join me as we explore the life, motivations, and lasting impact of this legendary figure. Get ready for a conversation that will take you on a journey through time and uncover the depths of Napoleon's fascinating persona. So without further ado, Let's begin. Before we dive into the depths of your remarkable achievements, could you please introduce yourself to our audience? Ladies and gentlemen, I, Napoleon Bonaparte, stand before you as a man molded by the tumultuous tides of history. Born on the 15th of August, 1769, on the enchanting island of Corsica, I emerged into a world that would bear witness to my relentless pursuit of greatness. My childhood was marked by ambition and a thirst for knowledge. I devoured the works of great philosophers, studying the strategies of legendary military leaders and immersing myself in the teachings of history's luminaries. It was during these formative years that the seeds of my destiny were sown as I honed my intellect and nurtured a burning desire for power and influence. As the years unfolded, I found myself entangled in the tempest of revolution that swept across France. The winds of change carried me to the heart of Paris, where I emerged as a military prodigy, rising swiftly through the ranks. Through sheer determination and strategic brilliance, I shattered the chains of mediocrity and ascended to the pinnacle of power. From the grandeur of the Louvre to the battlefields of Europe, my journey was one of conquest and dominion. I established the Napoleonic Code, a testament to the enduring legacy of my reign, and enacted sweeping reforms that shaped the very fabric of society. My ambition knew no bounds, as I sought to leave an indelible mark on the world and mold the future according to my vision. Yet, as with any mortal, my path was not without its flaws. Missteps were made, and the tides of fortune shifted. The battles of Austerlitz and Waterloo stand as testaments to both triumph and defeat. I stand before you today, humbled by the gravity of my past, ready to shed light on the complexities of my journey and the legacy I left behind. Napoleon, your rise to power and subsequent rule as Emperor of France had a profound impact on the world. Can you tell us about the motivations that drove you to achieve such heights of success? What were your ultimate goals and aspirations? David, your inquiry delves into the core of my being. From the depths of my soul, ambition surged like a raging torrent, propelling me forward with unwavering determination. I was driven by an insatiable hunger for greatness, a thirst to leave an indelible mark upon the annals of history. My ultimate goals and aspirations, they were as grand as the empires I sought to conquer. I yearned to reshape the world according to my vision, to forge a unified Europe under the banner of progress and enlightenment. I believed that through the consolidation of power and the establishment of order, I could bring stability and prosperity to the lands that fell beneath my gaze. I envisioned a society governed by reason, where the principles of equality, justice, and meritocracy would reign supreme. I aimed to create a legacy that would stand the test of time, a testament to my unwavering determination and profound influence. My ambitions knew no bounds, transcending the limitations of mortal existence. To quote one of my own proclamations, glory is fleeting, but obscurity is forever. I was propelled by a burning desire to secure my place among the immortals, to etch my name into the fabric of human memory. I seized the reins of destiny with an iron grip, shaping events and forging a path that would reverberate through the ages. But let it be known that my ambitions were not solely driven by personal gain. I believed that my reign would bring order and progress, ushering in an era of enlightenment and prosperity for the masses. It was this conviction that fueled my determination, for I saw myself as a harbinger of change, a catalyst for a brighter future. So, David, my motivations were a confluence of personal ambition, the pursuit of glory, and a sincere desire to shape the world for the better. Whether my aspirations were noble or self-serving, I leave that judgment to the annals of history. But one thing is certain. I walked a path that few dared to tread, and in doing so, I left an indelible mark upon the tapestry of human existence. Throughout history, you've been hailed as a military genius. But some critics argue that your victories were based on luck rather than strategic brilliance. What do you have to say about these claims? And how do you view your military successes? It is not surprising that such murmurs of luck would arise when faced with the magnitude of my military successes. But let me set the record straight and dispel any misconceptions that may cloud the truth. Luck, they say. I scoff at such trivialities. For it was not mere chance that led my armies to triumph after triumph. It was my unwavering strategic brilliance, honed through years of studying the art of war and analyzing the intricacies of battle. I possess an innate understanding of the ebb and flow of conflict, a gift that guided me to victory time and time again. My military successes were not founded on the capricious whims of fortune. They were meticulously crafted through a combination of careful planning, decisive action, and an unwavering belief in my abilities. I possessed an uncanny ability to read the battlefield, to foresee the movements of my adversaries, and to seize opportunities when they presented themselves. 
to my critics, I say this. It is easy to dismiss the achievements of others when one lacks the audacity to step onto the stage of history themselves. It is easy to attribute triumphs to luck when one cannot comprehend the intricacies of strategy and the indomitable spirit of a true leader. Let me remind the world of my victories at Austerlitz, where I masterfully outmaneuvered the combined forces of Austria and Russia, securing a resounding triumph. Or the Battle of Marengo, where I snatched victory from the jaws of defeat, turning the tides of war in favor of France. These were not strokes of luck but calculated moves, driven by an unyielding determination to emerge victorious. To assess my military career solely through the lens of luck is to diminish the magnitude of my achievements. It is to overlook the countless hours spent studying maps, devising tactics, and meticulously planning campaigns. It is to disregard the unwavering loyalty and discipline instilled in my troops, who fought with unmatched fervor under my command. So, David, I view my military successes as a testament to my strategic brilliance, my ability to seize opportunities, and my unwavering belief in the pursuit of victory. Luck may have danced upon the fringes of battle, but it was my unwavering resolve that led me to triumph and etched my name into the annals of military history. Napoleon, you once famously said, imagination rules the world. Can you elaborate on this statement and share how imagination played a role in your decision-making process and leadership style? Indeed David, I did proclaim that imagination rules the world, and those words still resonate with truth. Imagination played a pivotal role in shaping my decision-making process and leadership style, allowing me to transcend the confines of conventional thinking and envision a new world order. Imagination, to me, was not a mere flight of fancy, but a powerful tool that propelled me forward. It allowed me to see beyond the present circumstances, envision possibilities that others could not perceive, and chart a course towards a future that aligned with my ambitions. In the realm of warfare, imagination manifested as strategic innovation. I did not adhere rigidly to traditional tactics and strategies, but instead embraced creative approaches. I dared to imagine new formations, maneuvers, and methods of engagement that confounded my adversaries and gave my armies the upper hand. It was through this imaginative approach that I achieved remarkable military successes. Imagination also played a pivotal role in my leadership style. I understood that to lead effectively, I needed to inspire and rally my troops behind a shared vision. I utilized vivid imagery and compelling narratives to ignite their imaginations, fuel their passions, and foster unwavering loyalty. By painting a picture of a grand future, I motivated my soldiers to march fearlessly into battle, overcome seemingly insurmountable odds, and achieve greatness. Furthermore, imagination extended beyond the realm of warfare. It guided my vision for a transformed society, where education, infrastructure, and the arts flourished. I envisaged a new legal system, a revamped bureaucracy, and a unified civil code that would lay the foundation for a more equitable and progressive society. Imagination, in essence, fueled my audacity to challenge the status quo, to transcend the limitations of the present, and to envision a better future. It allowed me to disrupt the established order, ushering in an era of sweeping reforms and radical transformation. So, David, when I proclaimed that imagination rules the world, I spoke of the power it bestowed upon me to shape events, inspire others, and mold the destiny of nations. Imagination elevated me beyond the ordinary, enabling me to realize my ambitions and leave an indelible mark on history. It was a force that propelled me forward, guiding my decisions and infusing my leadership with a sense of vision and purpose. In conclusion, imagination was the catalyst that transformed my dreams into reality, and through its unwavering influence, I reshaped the world as I envisioned it. Your code Napoleon had a lasting impact on legal systems around the world, but it also faced criticism for its lack of democratic principles. How do you respond to those who argue that your legal reforms were more focused on consolidating power rather than ensuring justice for all? David, the Code Napoleon, a testament to my vision for a modern legal system. One that would transcend the antiquated laws of the past and provide a solid foundation for a progressive society. While it is true that my legal reforms faced criticism, it is important to understand the context in which they were implemented and the principles that guided my decision making. First and foremost, I must address the notion that my legal reforms were solely focused on consolidating power. While it is undeniable that centralization was a key aspect of my governance, it was driven by the need to establish a unified and efficient legal framework across the territories under my rule. Through the Code Napoleon, I sought to establish legal certainty, equality before the law, and a consistent set of rights and obligations for all citizens, regardless of their social status. Critics may argue that my reforms lack democratic principles, but it is essential to recognize that the concept of democracy in the early 19th century was evolving, and different nations had varying degrees of democratic participation. My primary objective was to create a legal system that promoted stability, order, and fairness. A system that could withstand the tumultuous times and provide a clear set of rules that all citizens could rely upon. 
the Code Napoleon was indeed a significant departure from the fragmented and archaic legal systems that prevailed across Europe. It simplified laws, abolished feudal privileges, and introduced a more egalitarian approach. It enshrined principles such as the presumption of innocence, equality before the law, and the protection of private property. A remarkable step forward in the pursuit of justice. Was the Code Napoleon perfect? Certainly not. No legal system can claim absolute perfection. However, it laid the groundwork for legal reforms that would influence numerous countries around the world. Its principles of civil equality and legal uniformity resonated far beyond the borders of France, shaping the legal systems of countless nations and leaving a lasting legacy that endures to this day. It is crucial to remember that my rule was characterized by a desire to bring stability and progress to a war-torn continent. The legal reforms I introduced aimed to establish a sense of order, promote economic growth, and provide a framework for social cohesion. While critics may point out the limitations of my reforms, it is essential to view them in the broader context of the era and the challenges I faced. In conclusion, David, the Code Napoleon was not without its flaws, but it represented a significant leap forward in legal innovation and the pursuit of justice. It sought to balance the need for order and stability with the ideals of equality and fairness. My intention was never to prioritize power over justice, but to create a legal system that would endure and benefit society as a whole. Napoleon, your military campaigns and conquests are renowned, but they also resulted in immense loss of life and suffering. How do you reconcile the immense human cost of your actions with the pursuit of your ambitions? Looking back, would you have approached your military endeavors differently? The human cost of war is indeed a heavy burden to bear. As a leader, I have always recognized the immense suffering that accompanies armed conflict, and I do not take it lightly. It is a matter that weighs heavily on my conscience, even to this day. When I reflect upon the immense loss of life and suffering caused by my military campaigns, it is impossible not to feel a profound sense of regret. The battles and wars I waged were fueled by my ambitions and my desire to shape the destiny of nations. However, the human toll of those endeavors is a reminder of the sacrifices made by countless individuals and families. In the pursuit of my ambitions, I was often faced with difficult choices and strategic decisions. The fog of war, the uncertainties of the battlefield, and the political intricacies of the time shaped the paths I chose. I cannot deny that there were instances where I could have approached military endeavors differently, with greater sensitivity to human life and well-being. It is in hindsight that one can truly evaluate the consequences of their actions, and looking back, I acknowledge that there were opportunities for me to exercise more restraint and seek alternative paths to achieve my goals. I recognize that there were instances where the immense loss of life outweighed the gains I sought. However, it is important to understand the context in which these decisions were made. The political landscape of Europe at the time was marked by constant struggle and conflict. It was a time of shifting alliances, power dynamics, and threats to the security and stability of France and its people. In such circumstances, difficult choices had to be made, and the human cost was unfortunately a part of that equation. While I cannot change the past, I can learn from it. The suffering and loss endured during my campaigns have left a lasting impact on me. They serve as a reminder of the consequences of unchecked ambition and the need for leaders to exercise prudence and empathy. My reflections on the human cost have shaped my perspective on war and leadership, and they continue to inform my actions and decisions. In conclusion, David, the immense human cost of my actions is a burden that I carry with me. I acknowledge the suffering that resulted from my military campaigns, and I reflect upon the choices I made. Hindsight reveals opportunities for a different approach, and I cannot ignore the regrets that accompany such reflections. The human toll of war is a somber reminder of the responsibility leaders bear, and it is my hope that future generations can learn from the lessons of history to pursue peace and prosperity for all. There are claims that your desire for control and dominance led to the rise of authoritarian regimes. How do you respond to these assertions, and what do you believe is your true legacy in the realm of governance and political systems? Claims of my desire for control and dominance often intertwined with the rise of authoritarian regimes. It is true that my rule was marked by a centralized authority and a strong hand in governance. However, it is essential to understand the context of the times and the challenges I faced as a leader. In the aftermath of the French Revolution France was in a state of turmoil. The nation yearned for stability and unity after years of unrest and uncertainty. My ascent to power was driven by a desire to bring order, restore France's standing in the world, and implement reforms that would ensure the well-being of its people. It is undeniable that my style of governance was characterized by a centralized authority. I believed in strong leadership and effective administration to accomplish the monumental tasks at hand. My ambition was to streamline the bureaucracy, establish efficient institutions, and bring about socio-economic reforms that would benefit the French people. 
This necessitated a degree of control and direction from the center. However, it is crucial to note that my intentions were not solely rooted in consolidating power for its own sake. I envisioned a system that would provide stability, justice, and equal opportunities for all citizens. My legal reforms, known as the Code Napoleon, aimed to create a comprehensive and uniform body of laws, replacing the patchwork of disparate legal systems that had existed across France. I believe that my true legacy in the realm of governance and political systems lies in the enduring impact of the reforms I implemented. The Code Napoleon, with its emphasis on equality before the law, individual rights, and meritocracy, served as a foundation for legal systems in many countries around the world. Its influence can still be seen today. While it is true that my rule was characterized by a strong central authority, it is important to recognize the complexities of the time and the challenges I faced. The balance between centralized power and individual liberties is a delicate one, and it is a challenge faced by leaders throughout history. In reflection, I acknowledge that there were instances where the pursuit of control and dominance may have overshadowed the ideal balance. It is a lesson I have learned, and I hope that future generations can draw from the successes and shortcomings of the past to shape governance systems that uphold individual liberties while maintaining stability and progress. In conclusion, the claims of my desire for control and dominance must be examined in the broader context of the times. While my rule was characterized by a centralized authority, my true legacy lies in the enduring impact of the reforms I implemented, particularly the Code Napoleon. As history unfolds, it is my hope that the lessons learned from my era can contribute to the evolution of governance and political systems, striking a harmonious balance between centralized power and individual liberties. Napoleon, your downfall at the Battle of Waterloo, is often attributed to a series of strategic and tactical mistakes. Looking back, what do you believe were the key factors that led to your defeat? And what lessons can we learn from your experiences? My dear interlocutor, the Battle of Waterloo, a moment in history that marked a significant turning point in my career. Reflecting upon my defeat, I cannot deny that there were indeed strategic and tactical errors that contributed to the outcome. Allow me to share my thoughts on the key factors that led to my downfall and the lessons we can draw from those experiences. First and foremost, the timing of the battle played a crucial role. The delay in commencing the engagement due to inclement weather and the ensuing muddy battlefield hindered our initial plans. This delay allowed my adversaries to gather their forces and form a formidable coalition against me. Time, as they say, is of the essence in warfare, and delays can have far-reaching consequences. Secondly, the coordination and communication among my subordinate commanders were not as effective as desired. It is essential for a leader to have a cohesive and well-coordinated command structure, allowing for swift execution of strategies and adaptation to changing circumstances. In the heat of battle, the ability to communicate and respond promptly can make all the difference. Additionally, there were specific tactical misjudgments on my part during the battle. The decision to commit my reserves prematurely without fully assessing the situation and the failure to adapt my strategy to the changing dynamics on the battlefield were mistakes that I must own. Flexibility and the ability to adjust one's plans based on the evolving situation are paramount in the art of war. In hindsight, one can always analyze and scrutinize the decisions made, dissecting the factors that led to victory or defeat. However, it is essential to recognize that war, as with life, is inherently unpredictable and filled with uncertainties. No leader is exempt from making mistakes, and it is through these moments of setback that valuable lessons can be learned. So, what lessons can we glean from my experiences? Firstly, the importance of adaptability and agility in the face of changing circumstances cannot be overstated. A leader must possess the foresight and flexibility to adjust their strategies as the situation demands. Rigidity and adherence to preconceived notions can be detrimental. Secondly, the significance of effective communication and coordination within the command structure cannot be emphasized enough. A well-organized and synchronized team is the backbone of success in any endeavor. Leaders must foster an environment of open communication and ensure that their subordinates understand the overall objectives. Lastly, the understanding that defeat does not equate to failure is crucial. It is in moments of adversity that true leaders rise, learn from their mistakes, and find the strength to persevere. History is replete with stories of great leaders who faced defeats but ultimately triumphed in the face of challenges. In conclusion, the Battle of Waterloo serves as a reminder that even the most powerful leaders are not infallible. The key factors that led to my defeat include timing, coordination, and tactical misjudgments. The lessons we can draw from these experiences revolve around adaptability, effective communication, and resilience in the face of setbacks. Life is a continuous learning process, and it is through reflection and the willingness to evolve that we can grow as individuals and leaders.
During your reign, you implemented various social reforms and initiatives, such as the establishment of public schools and the Napoleonic Code. However, critics argue that these reforms were driven by a desire for control, rather than genuine concern for the well-being of the people. How do you respond to these claims? And what do you believe was the true intention behind your social reforms? It is true that during my reign, I implemented various initiatives aimed at improving the social fabric of the nation, such as the establishment of public schools and the Napoleonic Code. Critics have suggested that these reforms were driven solely by a desire for control, questioning my genuine concern for the well-being of the people. I am here to present a different perspective. First and foremost, let us not forget the context in which these reforms were enacted. France, at the time, was emerging from a tumultuous period of revolution and upheaval. It was my conviction that stability and order were necessary to restore the nation and allow it to thrive. The social reforms I implemented were not solely driven by a desire for control, but were part of a broader vision to establish a foundation for a prosperous and harmonious society. Education, for instance, played a pivotal role in my reforms. By establishing public schools, I aimed to provide equal access to education for all citizens, irrespective of their social standing. Education, in my view, is the cornerstone of progress and empowerment. By nurturing knowledge and intellect, we enable individuals to better themselves and contribute to the collective well-being of the nation. It was not merely an instrument of control, but a means to uplift and enlighten the populace. Similarly, the Napoleonic Code, which unified and standardized a legal system, aimed to bring clarity and fairness to the laws of the land. It was designed to replace the outdated and inconsistent legal frameworks that plagued the country. The code guaranteed equality before the law, protected individual property rights, and promoted meritocracy. These principles were intended to establish a just and equitable society, fostering a sense of security and confidence among the citizens. While it is true that my reign was characterized by a strong central authority, it is important to recognize that stability and effective governance are prerequisites for progress. By establishing a clear and efficient administrative structure, I sought to bring about order and eliminate the chaos that had plagued France for so long. The reforms implemented were not driven solely by a desire for control, but rather by a vision of a strong and prosperous nation. It is understandable that my actions and reforms may be subject to criticism and interpretation. History has a tendency to magnify certain aspects while overlooking others. However, I assure you that my intentions were rooted in a genuine desire to rebuild France, secure its future, and ensure the well-being of its citizens. In conclusion, my social reforms were driven by a vision of stability, progress, and justice. Education, legal reforms, and the establishment of a strong governance structure were instrumental in fostering a cohesive and prosperous society. While critics may question my motivations, I remain steadfast in my belief that these reforms were not simply tools of control, but a means to empower the people and pave the way for a better future. Throughout history, your romantic relationships have often captivated the public's imagination. Can you share any insights into the role love and relationships played in your life, and how they may have influenced your decision-making or political alliances? Love, like any human emotion, holds the power to both inspire and complicate one's life. Throughout my journey, I experienced profound connections with remarkable women who left an indelible mark on my heart. These relationships undoubtedly influenced my thoughts and actions, for matters of the heart often intertwine with matters of state. Josephine de Beharnais, my first wife and empress of the French, was a woman of charm and grace. Our union was one built on passion, but it was not without its challenges. Despite our deep affection, circumstances led us down different paths. Nevertheless, Josephine's influence on me was profound. She possessed a social finesse and political astuteness that proved invaluable during my early years as a leader. Her guidance and counsel were instrumental in shaping my policies and alliances. It was through love that I later found myself drawn to Marie-Louise of Austria, the daughter of Emperor Francis I. This marriage served political purposes, as it solidified alliances and sought to bridge divides between nations. However, I would be remiss not to acknowledge the genuine affection that developed between us. Our son, the King of Rome, was the embodiment of our union and a symbol of hope for the future. Love, in its complexity, does not exist solely within the confines of marriage. It extends beyond, into the realms of friendships and alliances. Talented and intelligent women such as Pauline Bonaparte and Marie Waluska graced my life with their presence, leaving their mark on my journey. These relationships, though not conventional in nature, provided me with emotional support and companionship during times of both triumph and tribulation. While love and relationships undoubtedly influenced my decisions, it is important to note that they were but one thread woven into the intricate tapestry of my life. I was driven by a grand vision for France and a desire to shape the destiny of nations. My decisions and political alliances were primarily guided by strategic considerations and the pursuit of national interests. 
Love may have played its part, but it did not overshadow the larger picture. I was a leader burdened with the weight of responsibility and the aspirations of a nation. Love added color and depth to my existence, but it did not compromise my determination to achieve greatness. In conclusion, love and relationships had their place in my life, shaping my experiences and influencing my decisions to a certain extent. However, they were but elements within a larger mosaic of ambition, duty, and the pursuit of a grand vision. The complexities of love and its interplay with political alliances are aspects that historians and romantics alike shall continue to ponder for generations to come. Napoleon, your name is synonymous with ambition, conquest, and power, but beyond the military and political realms. What do you consider to be your greatest contribution to humanity? What legacy would you like to be remembered for? Ambition, conquest, and power indeed define much of my legacy, but there is more to the story of Napoleon Bonaparte than mere military and political exploits. When considering my greatest contribution to humanity and the legacy I wish to be remembered for, I turn my gaze beyond the battlefield and into the realm of ideas and progress. While I reshaped the political landscape of Europe and left an indelible mark on history, it is my belief that my greatest contribution lies in the realm of governance and the pursuit of societal advancement. I sought to build a foundation that would endure beyond my own reign, leaving behind a legacy that would benefit humanity for generations to come. One of my most significant contributions was the creation of the Napoleonic Code, a comprehensive civil law system that unified and modernized legal principles across territories under my control. This code, which still influences legal systems in various parts of the world, promoted equality before the law, protected individual property rights, and established a framework for meritocracy and career advancement. It aimed to provide a sense of order, fairness, and stability to society, transcending the chaos that often accompanies shifting power structures. Furthermore, I championed educational reforms and the establishment of public schools, recognizing the transformative power of knowledge and the importance of education in fostering a skilled and enlightened citizenry. By promoting access to education for all, regardless of social status, I aim to empower individuals, nurture talent, and cultivate a sense of national unity and loyalty. In addition to legal and educational reforms, I also facilitated infrastructure development, such as the construction of roads, bridges, and canals, which stimulated commerce, facilitated trade, and enhanced connectivity within and between regions. These initiatives not only bolstered economic growth, but also fostered a sense of national cohesion and progress. Beyond the realms of governance and infrastructure, I fostered patronage of the arts and sciences, encouraging intellectual pursuits and innovation. The establishment of the Legion d'Honneur, an order of merit, sought to recognize and reward individuals for their contributions to society, be it in the fields of science, literature, or the arts. My greatest contribution to humanity, therefore, lies in the amalgamation of these efforts a comprehensive vision for progress, enlightenment, and societal advancement. I aspire to create a legacy characterized by the principles of meritocracy, equality before the law, access to education, infrastructure development, and the promotion of intellectual and artistic pursuits. These ideals, I hope, will endure as a testament to my vision for a better society, transcending the boundaries of time and inspiring future generations. While I recognize that my ambitions and methods were subject to criticism and controversy, it is my sincere desire that history remembers me not only for my military conquests, but also for the lasting contributions I made in shaping the world and striving for the betterment of humanity. That concludes our list of thought-provoking questions for our special guest Napoleon Bonaparte. With these inquiries, we aim to explore the depths of his life, motivations, triumphs, and controversies. Join us in the upcoming episode as we delve into the extraordinary journey of one of history's most influential figures. Subscribe to Timeless Talks to witness this captivating conversation and become a part of our community of lifelong learners. Remember, the wisdom of the past can guide us forward. Stay curious, stay engaged, and stay timeless.